Hello, today is Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. I'm Joe Schmidt from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about managing your IT contracts in the event of a divestiture of one or more of your businesses. Divestiture, now that may be the sale of a business unit to another company, or it may be spinning off one of your business units into a new standalone business. And when this happens, a ton of work is needed to make sure the vendor contracts will appropriately support the divestiture. It's tricky stuff, and I'm fortunate to be joined by a couple of guys that know a thing or two about how to deal with this contracting effort and are willing to share some insight. I'm here with Ben Fox, one of TC2's managing directors, and Mark Lindsay, who is a senior partner at LB3, and Mark is also the president of Avenue 4, which is a leading IPv4 advisory firm. Hey, Ben and Mark, thank you for joining me today. Hello, Joe. Nice to talk to you again. Great to be back, Joe. Thanks for the intro. Okay, Mark, why don't you kick this off by explaining some of the terminology that's used when companies are dealing with a divestiture? Uh, yes, happy to do it. It can be difficult to follow all this without a common framework. So for our conversation today, there are three parties to a merger, acquisition, or divestiture. And the first one we'll talk about is the original company. The original company is the company that is selling or spinning off the divested company. The original company holds the contracts with the service providers, which is the subject matter of our conversation later on. The domestic company is the business that the original company is selling to an acquiring company or spinning off into a standalone company. And when appropriate, we use the term acquiring company to refer to the company that is actually buying a divested company from the original company. All right. Thanks for that, Mark. So, Ben, what approaches do companies typically take with their contracts in the event of a divestiture? So, Joe, there are two primary approaches that get employed. So the first approach, which tends to be referred to as a transition services agreement approach, is where the original company that's enacting the divestiture agrees to let the divested company continue to consume services under the original company's contracts for some period of time, even after the divestiture has actually occurred. And then the second approach is where the original company works to create carbon copies, if you will, of all its supplier contracts for the divested company to take and to use, such that by the time of the divestiture, that divested company has a full set of completely standalone supplier contracts that are not related to the existing company at all. And of course, in reality, it's often the case that some combination of these two approaches ends up being used. And equally, regardless of these contracting positions, both approaches still require the separation of assets and all the infrastructure and all the services to be split up between the original company and the domestic company. Hey, so why don't we look at each of these approaches in a bit more detail? So, Mark, how about if you start us off with that second approach that Ben mentioned that he termed, I think, create carbon copies of your contracts, that, that approach? Sure, Joe. So under the carbon copy approach, the goal is for the original company to negotiate new standalone contracts pre-divestiture that are intended to govern the services that the divested company will need post-divestiture. This is often preferred when the divested company is spun out into a standalone publicly traded company. Capital markets often devalue spit outs that remain too attached to the original companies. The general approach is to copy the contracts and split the services. The objective is to create those carbon copies of the original company's contracts for the divested company, but with appropriate adjustments to the spend volume commitments to reflect the relative size of the divested company. However, you can imagine suppliers don't normally just let their customers copy and paste contracts into brand new carbon copies for the divested company. That's exactly right, Mark. You know, more often than not, there's a really significant negotiation associated with that adaptation of the existing contract terms for the domestic company. For instance, in many cases, the supplier won't just replicate the existing contract terms of what may be a much smaller domestic company. So additionally to that, a lot of outsourcing contracts include overarching fixed costs and functions. So for example, splitting those overarching functions and costs into two equivalent functions for two separate companies, that will typically lose efficiencies at scale. And accordingly, the total aggregate costs may actually increase. 
which means price rises for both the original company and the divested company to be dealt with. And of course, there's always a negotiation needed to reduce any spend or volume commitments in the original company's contracts just to reflect the spend or the volume that will move away with the divested company and also to set new volume commitments, new spend commitments for the divested company contracts too. All right, I get that. So Mark, what is the transition services agreement approach? Under this approach, the TSA approach, the original company and the divested company enter into a transition services agreement or TSA. TSA provides an obligation for the original company to provide services to the divested company for some predefined period. You know, 12 months, 24 months is not unusual. That typically means allowing the divested company to continue to take services for the interim period, the transition period, until the original company establishes its own independent contract. That allows them adequate time to establish their own service arrangements, which involves, as I mentioned, negotiating the new contracts and actually migrating the services away from the original company into a separate set of service arrangements. The TSA is often the default approach when there's a merger and acquisition. In that context, there's a lot less pressure for the domestic company to have independent standalone operations so they have some more time to rationalize their services. The actual cost of the services consumed by the divested company may be addressed in a variety of ways. They can be charged to the divested company as a part of an overall TSA fee that's payable to the original company. They can be paid by the original company and charged back to the divested company on a line item basis that can be with or without a markup. Alternatively, they could be invoiced directly to the divested company by the vendor, who is then paid directly by the divested company. So, Ben, that approach would seem a little simpler, at least contractually, is it? Well, yes and no, I suppose. There are absolutely still some really important contractual challenges. So, for example, one challenge is whether or not suppliers are obliged or will even agree to allow the divested company to use and to purchase services under the original company's contract when that divested company is no longer even a part of the original company. You know, in ordinary circumstances, you would never expect to have that right. And then other complications such as who's liable for the acts and the emissions of the divested company. For example, what happens if the divested company doesn't pay its bill? Does the original company have to pay it? That's a particularly tricky topic. And then also managing your supplier commitments can be really tricky if you're not actually in control anymore of the divested company's spend and supplier decisions. All right, that all makes sense. So, Mark, you're the lawyer here today. So what terms or provisions can companies include in their IT contracts to help facilitate divestitures and make all of this a whole lot easier? Joe, one concept you should seek to include in your supplier contracts is to make sure that the supplier has an obligation to create a carbon copy, a replication of the original company's contract for the benefit of the divested company. Suppliers, however, really don't like doing that in advance. They don't like committing to recreating a contract without knowing the commercials of the two different contracts. But they will often agree to allow for a substantial replication of the original contract under comparable rates and charges. But inevitably, there would need to be some negotiation when it actually happens for the adjustments to the rates and charges. But that clause would give you the leverage to establish that replicated contract, that carbon copy contract on a meaningful basis. An additional right you should include is an obligation for the supplier to continue to provide the services to the divested business for some period of time, typically 12 up to 24 months. In this situation, you continue to enjoy the exact same rates and charges, terms and conditions as if the divested company was an actual affiliate under the prior arrangement. This is oftentimes allows for a smooth period of time for that divested company to set up its own independent relationships with the supplier. So another default concept that I think it's also important to seek to include in your contract is the right to reduce any commitments in the event of the divestiture. So such clauses, they typically provide the customer with the right to automatically reduce the original company's post-divestiture revenue or volume commitments or proportionate to the contributory services consumed by the divested company. And also as part of that adjustment, you should have the right to preserve the pre-divestiture unit pricing, any discount tiers that applied, any resource utilization thresholds for reduced resource charges, all that kind of thing. 
all of those thresholds should be adjusted downward to account for the divested company's pre-divestiture spend. And then suppliers, in reality, will normally push for limits on the maximum automatic adjustments that are permitted under such a clause. For example, before price renegotiations are required to accommodate further commitment or utilization erosion. So setting those limits, those thresholds, if you will, that's all part of the negotiation of this particular clause. Hey, thanks, Ben. And thank you as well, Mark. Now, obviously, this has been a great discussion. And if you would like to learn more about strategies for managing your contracts through a divestiture, or if you just have other ICT needs, you can contact Ben, Mark, me, or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues by giving us a call or shooting us an email. You can also stay up to date by subscribing to these Staying Connected podcasts, by checking out our websites, and by following us on LinkedIn.